our moderator for today. Uh, we wanted to start off by asking our participants to give us a sense of who's out there. If you have actually opened your school or if you are still awaiting to open. So in your um, screens in the lower part, um, you will find reactions as an option. Give us a, an indication of where you are. If you have not opened yet for your school, then please indicate the thumbs up. If you have already opened, then let's hit the, the ta-da, the, the confetti coming out of the horn. So we get a feel of where you're at. Sorry, Sister Sue, can you repeat the instructions? <laughs> Welcome, Sister Layla, you bet. <laughs> We're looking at in the reaction section where you see on the bottom usually of your screen, chat, share screen, record, reactions. If you click on reactions, you will find some emojis and you're able to put thumbs up if you are not open yet and give us the ta-da with the confetti flying out if you have already successfully opened. So we get an idea of where everyone's at. Okay, with that, let's begin. Um, we're going to begin with Brother William White, who is a board member of CISNA. We have several board members actually with us. We'll have Brother uh, Ziad Abdullah, who's also a board member, and Sister Aram Sheikh Jilani, a board member. And of course, you're looking at Sister Layla, our president. And in the background, running things as always and setting up everything that we need to be this uh, functional organization is Sister Sophia Azmat, our executive director. So let's begin with Brother William. William White is the principal at the Islamic School of Louisville in Kentucky and the board secretary of CISNA. As a principal, he led his school to its initial accreditation through Advanced Ed and CISNA and has helped establish a variety of programs and initiatives that have improved the school's enrollment and academic performance. William is passionate about continuous improvement and regularly serves on accreditation teams for Islamic schools. As a certified leadership facilitator, he also provides leadership training for both adults and students who are interested in improving their knowledge of effective leadership practices. And he walks the talk. So welcome, Brother William. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. I want to first say that I am here just as much to present, but more so to actually listen to other people's ideas. And I think this is an awesome opportunity for all of us to learn together. We're all going through difficult circumstances. And with the shared pool of knowledge that we have, we can do a whole lot more than we can individually. So thank you so much for joining. I titled this brief part of my presentation, I don't plan on talking for long, 10 minutes or so, maybe 15 at most. Uh, and I've titled it, Forgetting the Box. So we talk about thinking outside of the box. We may, in this case, because things have been flipped upside down, we may have to forget the box completely and think in completely different ways about how we are either reopening our schools or maintaining what we do once we reopen them. So what I want to really focus on, since I'm the first presenter here, is talking a little bit about the thinking, the planning on when you're reopening, how to do it, and perhaps what research says is the most effective way. And then after that, give some examples of how we've tried to implement those in our own school. So that's the general outline that we have here. So uh, I looked for pictures. I think pictures uh, say a whole lot more than, than words many times. And the first picture I could find that I thought described the summer planning process that we had at our school, which is in Louisville, Kentucky, uh, was this guy standing upside down on his head uh, trying to look at his laptop. It was ch challenging to do it because summer, challenge, summer planning is difficult already, but then doing so not knowing exactly what's going to happen a month or two down the road has not been easy. What we did at our school is the original plan was to have a full return to campus. Things looked optimistic here in Kentucky. The cases were relatively low and that was what the public schools were planning on doing. That's what all the private schools were planning on doing. So that was our original plan, going in through May, going in through June. Um, so throw, middle of June, towards July, things started to look a little bit iffy. There was a spike in cases. The governor started talking about the idea of possibly delaying school or having a hybrid option. So we started moving more towards hybrid. And then eventually um, the governor in Kentucky recommended that all schools delay school until uh, the end of September at the earliest. 
So a little bit before that recommendation was done, we had kind of seen the writing on the wall and we decided that it's best for us to go with the fully online model and really focus on doing that in the absolute best way possible. So that's what we're doing now. We opened our school uh, last, not this Wednesday, but the previous Wednesday. So what I, we were faced with and what I'm sure everyone is faced with are how to do this in a way where we have parents and we have students and community members that are oftentimes on two different extremes. The first extreme we might have, and this is not to belittle parents that feel this way because I often feel this way too, but having this over very, very cautious, very, very concerned about opening schools, very concerned about your kids being safe. We have this one, and we also have the other parents, this is the best I could find of parents just saying, please take my child, I can't do this anymore, I can't do online learning, my kid doesn't do online learning well, or I don't do online learning well. So this is kind of the situation I'm sure all of you um, have found yourself in or still find yourself in and will throughout this entire year. So when it comes to this, we know this is a difficult situation. When it comes to how we address it, sometimes, and it's natural for me and for all of us to think about what are the solutions that we have? What can we do? How do we come up with a way to make it happen? What I would like to do is to, to stop a little bit and talk about leadership, what leadership says and how important leadership is and what we can do to make sure that what we do in our schools actually goes with what is considered to be a best practice in research. I thank Sister Sophia for this quote. We did a workshop together about a year ago when we could still do those things. And she had suggested this quote, in periods where there is no leadership, society stands still. This is from former president Harry S. Truman. I think we all have seen what happens when there is a lack of leadership. Things don't really happen, right? There is a lot of chaos and it is a very huge burden that we have to be leaders. And we have to make sure that how we are behaving is in the best way possible. There is something that I, uh, I'm familiar with something called the Leadership Challenge. There's two authors uh, in, in university in California that uh, called the Leadership Challenge, Jim Cousins and Barry Posner. And I really love this quote, if we stop and look at this for a second. We think about leadership. We have leadership all around us. It's not just us if we are principals or board members. Everyone is a leader. And notice what the quote says and what is emphasized. Leadership is not for the anointed few. Leadership is not about personality. It's about behavior, an observable set of skills and abilities that can be learned. It's not just whether or not a person it has a leadership personality or not. It's whether or not all of us are exhibiting leadership behaviors. And these behaviors can be learned. And there's a couple behaviors I want to look at and talk about how we are trying to implement those during this really challenging time in our school. This comes from the research from Kuzas and Posner and something that they have developed. It's been around since the 1980s. There have been nearly 3 million participants from schools, different countries, every different type of corporate nonprofit organization you can think of. And this is a really amazing illustration of how important our leadership behaviors are. If you look here at the bottom, let's look at the behavior that the leadership, the leader exhibits. The leader challenges people to try new and innovative ways to do their work. If we look at the other axis here, we see the percentage of reports that are willing to work hard. How many of us want the people that we are working with to be willing to work hard? Leadership, this is a struggle. This is a difficult challenge. We want people to want to work hard because that's the only way to get done what we need to get done. If you look at the research, when, when the followers, when direct reports say that their leader rarely or almost never challenges people to try new and innovative ways, only 5% say that they are willing to work hard. This is not a small sample of 100 people. We're talking about millions of people. 12% when it becomes seldom. 30% are willing to work hard when the leader occasionally does it. 61% when they do it fairly often. But 94% of people say that they're willing to work hard when their leader very frequently or almost always challenges people to try out new and innovative ways to do things. I think we've all experienced that. If you're just given something and say, do this and you must do it in this particular way, there, is room, there are times when that's necessary. But if you're constantly not given any room to try to innovate, you're really not going to be willing to work hard over a long term. The second, the last behavior we're gonna look at here and then talk about some examples. Before we talk about that, I wanna ask a question. So this is, how often do we develop relationships with those that we lead? If we want people to be willing to work hard, if we want them to be engaged, there have to be relationships. How often do we stop and do that, especially during a time of crisis when it feels like there's no time to do it? 
how often do we encourage our staff and parents to share ideas, innovative ways, and actually act upon those? If we look at this last behavior here, there's another example of this. So the leader develops cooperative relationships among the people that they work with. And on the other axis, we have the percentage of direct reports who agree that their leader is effective. I would hope that all of us would like to work with people who feel or agree that we are being effective in what we do. Almost never when they don't develop cooperative relationships, there's 15% who say that they believe the leader is effective. But look at this staircase model as it moves all the way up to very frequently a leader develops those cooperative relationships with people, 96% of them say or feel that their leader is being effective in what they do. Notice one of the trends on this. Once again, this is leadership is behavior. It's not your title. Just because we are titled principal, board member, whatever it is, we don't necessarily get these results from people just by having the title. We get the results by the frequency that we use leadership-based behaviors to keep people engaged and to do what needs to get done to help our students. So the more you do these behaviors, the more frequently you exhibit it, the more, the more engagement you're going to have. Now, what I would like to talk about is just a couple of brief examples of some things that we've done at our school and some examples of how we've tried to, to, to develop collaborative relationships with people and to get those innovative ideas from others, not just from me or not just from a couple administrators, but really looking out outside of our school and within our school community to come up with this. So our school opened a couple weeks ago, week and a half ago, uh, fully online. We don't have any on-campus activities right now. We're looking and doing that after this six week period to transition, but we're going to see how the situation evolves. One of the things that we were thinking of and I was guilty of was thinking in terms of when we open, so if we need to do an orientation to educate our students, I was thinking in terms of either this or that, A or B. If we are either on campus, we do an on-campus orientation, and if we're online, then we should do an online orientation. But the idea actually came from our staff members and from some of our parents is that how can we actually do online but have an on-campus orientation for students? So what we decided to do is we offered an optional on-campus orientation for students or parents that were unable, we had an online orientation. It's a ton of work to do it, but we saw a huge benefit my own children, the one on the right is my son, Hamza, he's shut here, here. There's only two or three kids in the classroom at this time. He had a blast. He went from hiding under the table, I don't wanna go online, to I cannot wait to see my teacher when we started class the next day. So here's another example of a kindergarten class. We had five kids in there. A lot of those students came, uh, the, the parents are saying they're not excited about school, they don't wanna do online again. These kids showed up on the first day of school with a completely different view on things. Our logic behind this was to get the kids excited about school, to develop some contact time with the teacher. And in addition to that, to show them that school looks different than it used to. It's not the same school that you left in March. If we come back to school, there's going to be different desks. There's gonna be different masks to get, see how all those things go and to test out those policies and those protocols that we came up with to see what was really effective. So when we do return to campus, we're better prepared to do it. That brings me to the next thing. What were those policies, protocols, processes that we had in place? I wanna talk a little bit about all of us. We have a, a new teacher expectations. We have parent expectations and student expectations. And at the end of this slide, for what they're worth, I have sent links on there. So when this is shared out, you are more than welcome to access any of them. If you wanna look at them, download them, edit them for your school, suggest things for ours to be better, please do. But how did we come up with these? I've tried to avoid first year as a principal. Okay, it's my job. This is what they're paying me for. I'm gonna write these, pro I will look at different and I will research different ideas and I will come up with them. I might ask a few people here and there, trying to do things differently as, as I go through my principalship. And I've learned that the, one of the most important people to be engaged during the whole teacher expectations, how we're going to engage students, what the expectations are for students is to engage the teachers in that. So one of the first, instead of maybe my first year as a principalship, I'm now doing my sixth year, instead of just telling them and lecturing them going through the slide and saying, this is what you need to do, this is what you're expected to do, is I shared with them a draft and we had teachers and parents involved throughout the summer. And then we, first thing that we did when we came back was to actually look through these policies, put people in actual groups and have them actually give feedback and suggestions to the whole team and say, this is what we love about this. This is what seems great. And here's something I think that might need to be added. It took time, but we've seen that the, 
this number one makes people involved and the teachers are the people who are going to really be the front lines of this. So they need to really be involved in that. And number two, it's a lot more effective for people to think and to present on things than it is simply to lecture them about it. Especially during these days with COVID brain or whatever you want to call it, our, our ability to process a lot of information is limited. So this is a simple process that we followed at work for us. So over the summer, there were subcommittees to focus on those areas. We shared those drafts with different stakeholders. And then in order, before finalizing it, we actually designed group activities where we assigned certain segments. And we had our teachers look, dive in on, uh, on specific areas and present out to the staff and have those conversations. And we made a lot of really effective changes, things that I completely slipped my mind and slipped all of our administrators' minds and say, thank you for that. Because when we launched it, it's been going much smoother as a result. So that is really all I have for my, my section. I'm happy to answer any questions if anyone has them about anything that I've said so far. These are the links that come up, teacher expectations, parent student expectations. Um, when we did a parent town hall presentation, we did that on, online for the parents. I have a link to that presentation. So if anyone has not done one yet, you're welcome to download it, edit it for your school. And last but not least, I have the link to the research that I mentioned here and the leadership challenge. So thank you all very much. And I look forward to hearing your ideas as well. That's great. Thank you so much. As always, you're full of inspiration. Um, some people are asking about these links. So perhaps as we go on with the other presentations, you might be able to like put the hyperlinks into the chat, Brother William. Is that possible? Yes, I can do that. Yeah, I can. I'll copy those and just share the links into the chat. And then if we when we post the recording, um, I can also post this presentation as well if anyone wants the any of the research that's there. And you can actually click on the links on that last slide too. That's fantastic. Thank you. So I gathered from that that you had to develop relationships. You're encouraging your staff and your parents to share their innovative solutions. And then everybody becomes a leader. And the more that you challenge people, oftentimes the more that they will rise to the top. So thank you for that. Any other questions that you might have, please feel free to put them into the chat box and uh, we'll pull back around. Okay. Let's go next to Brother Ziad Abdullah. He is the principal of the Huda Academy of Arkansas. He holds a bachelor's degree in jurisprudence, legislation, and guidance of Islam, and a master's in Islamic education. Brother Ziad began his teaching career as an Arabic and Islamic studies teacher for both middle and high school levels. In addition, he was an Arabic professor at Richland College, lecturer of Arabic and Islamic studies at Sofa Islamic Seminary, and a member of the American Council on the Teaching of Foreign Languages, ACTFL, which we are well familiar with. So right. what else? Thank you. Jazakumullah khair, everyone, for uh, attending this uh, webinar. Inshallah, um, I will try my best, you know, to give you a summary of what we did and what we faced. Uh, we'll start with... Um, this, everyone, uh, like what uh, Brother William said, uh, were, you know, juggling balls, thinking a lot, uh, changing plans, uh, looking at different resources. And Alhamdulillah, uh, I think with Cisna WhatsApp group, there is a lot of resources. So uh, that, that was excellent. We got a lot of ideas uh, to use. Uh, of course, attending webinars, different organizations, a lot of information. Uh, I'm sure many of you attended maybe 20 less more, uh, you know, webinars or um, lectures. Uh, also reading CDC, you know, guidelines, ADH, DHS, Little Rock School District in our uh, area and uh, Arkansas Department of Education. Brother Ziad, excuse me, could I ask you to project a little bit louder, please, so we can hear you more clearly? A little more volume, a little more volume. Okay. Thank uh, you. Sorry. No problem. <clears throat> I think uh, my voice always low, so... <laughs> okay, uh, so uh, what we uh, started with is a survey for parents to know what they want to do. So we had majority or 50%, around 50% want to do in person. I think the uh, previous experience from March till May, Alhamdulillah, we did our job, but parents uh, were overwhelmed, especially with our parents. 
uh, that we have, we have both of them working parents. So it was difficult for them to manage that. Uh, we started looking for uh, who can put the plans. Uh, as we mentioned again with Brother Williams, as a principal, you can do the plan and you have to do the plan, but we decide to do a task force. And with the task force, um, we did a board member, teacher, uh, parents, different backgrounds, uh, different uh, age group kids they have in the school, different even uh, professions. So I was worried that I will have majority of doctors because you know I'm gonna get to this, don't do this, do that, don't do this, do that. But Alhamdulillah, we managed to have, uh, you know, three doctors uh, it was helpful for me and for, uh, you know, taking decisions. And also uh, we have uh, uh, different between young and, you know, uh, new generation of uh, our kids who is, you know, uh, uh, new parents. And, and we have a lot of good input from them too. Uh, other resources that we looked for, which is money, uh, as you know, uh, and Alhamdulillah, we got a grant through our state. Uh, we bought our, you know, gloves, uh, um, masks, uh, everything that we need to that on, on that regard. And that grant where uh, they give you a thousand dollar per full time teacher and they give you the money All what you need to do. When you buy, you just need to record that so they know you spend the money uh, towards something they approve. And we have to finish this money by December. So that's why we put a lot of money in different things to make sure we are ready to open the school. Uh, CARES Act, we put our money toward technology uh, and I will share with you what we did. Of course, uh, as a school, we did um, in class and virtual. So we had to send a document for all the parents about the opening safety guidelines that we put as a task force. And then we had to meet with the parents twice and we did town hall meeting in those, uh, you know, uh, two times. So first time we presented what we were gonna do as far as academics and it was me was presenting that <clears throat> and for resources was the chair person or the board chair who um, uh, shared where we put the money and what we uh, gonna do and for the safety and health uh, we got a doctor who is who was in charge of this so he was the main person we go back to and he uh, you know, shared with the parents all the policies uh, regarding safety and health. And then we did uh, an update to answer some questions that they were, you know, uh, sent from uh, parents uh, and other uh, uh, members. I'll move to this. This is was uh, our agenda. Usually we talk about academics and health. And for example, we shared with the parents a mock class, which is uh, what we did, a teacher taught math, and we had the other teachers who is online. So we did an actual class in person and on the same time uh, with Google Meet, uh, the teacher you know, uh, taught uh, other teachers. So, and we put this on Facebook and we had a lot of people who really went and looked at it and liked it, uh, which is, that's what you share with them, some information about what you're gonna do. Uh, sometimes people cannot imagine what you are talking about unless if they see an example of uh, what you have. Uh, I'll move on, we had some issues with books and technology. We did not receive our technology and books. And as you know now, uh, whatever you order, you need to think about, oh, it may come back, it may be back order or something like that. Uh, 
So uh, we did the order. I think we will get our uh, swivel cameras on Monday, this coming Monday. Uh, so Alhamdulillah, uh, it's going on. I hope we get everything as soon as uh, we can get each other. Uh, I'll give you an example of something that we answered. Uh, people were worried in toddler class, what our kids gonna do? You know, there is no mask for them. They may touch each other. They may play with the same, you know, uh, toys or something like that. So we uh, shared this with them. Uh, each uh, student will have their picture on the box. They go get their box, play with their toy, and they have their place to sit. Of course, you are not going to guarantee 100% that they are not going to take toys from each other or play with each other, but that's what uh, we shared. One of the important things that we shared also is the class capacity. Uh, so we said if you are in person, you are in. If you are virtual, you are virtual. Sometimes I cannot manage to have you as virtual in class. I'll give an example of second grade. Second grade, the capacity of the class, I have 12 desks. I cannot add more because you have to do the six feet distancing. So, uh, and I have in class 12. So, and I have virtual six. So if you decide now to tell me, I want to send my child to be in person, I'm sorry, I cannot do this. So it was clear uh, expectation from our side and parents know this uh, and that's what we shared with them uh, uh, to make sure we are on the same page when it comes to uh, in class and following the guidelines. Uh, I'll move on to a few things that we did uh, starting from the screening and masks. Uh, we had, um, you know, a, a station for this. Of course, there, there were uh, questionnaires sent through WhatsApp group to the parents to fill every morning when they uh, arrive. Uh, every day we have a different color, as you see, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Every day we check your temperature. You are good to go. Uh, you did the screening questions. We'll give you the sticker and you go in the school. You cannot enter the school without a sticker and without a mask. This is teachers, kids, everyone. Okay, uh, we will move on to show you how the setup of the classes. Um, this is what we did. We put, uh, you know, uh, those, uh, you know, stickers in the floor to make sure no kid will move that chair from that spot to make sure we are, uh, you know, uh, abiding by the rules. As you see here in the bathroom, this sink you cannot use because the distance between the two sinks is less than six feet. Uh, we did not close it. We just put, we just closed the, you know, uh, the uh, source of water to this sink. So nobody can use this sink. And there is a sign, there is a steps what to do to wash your hands. Uh, in the water fountain, as an example, we thought, Nobody can use the water fountain till we figure out, okay, the purpose behind the water fountain, not to touch the surface. So everyone will touch the same surface. So we were lucky. We changed those, uh, you know, uh, water fountain last year. We had one upstairs and one downstairs and they have the bottle service. So you don't have to touch anything. You just put your bottle and uh, fill your bottle with water. Uh, I'll move forward. Uh, we contracted with uh, some companies to make sure uh, we are, you, you know, sometimes if you look for sanitizer or wipes, Clorox wipes, you may not find them in the market. Or if you found them, you may get them after a month or two. So we decide to go with a the company. They will provide us with every, everything. As you see in uh, uh, the left side uh, picture, these uh, disinfecting, you know, liquids, uh, it mixed with water. All what you need to do is fill out your bottle and take it with you with uh, a, a cl a cloth a towel to clean your desk, to clean your, um, 
keyboard, mouse, if you want to use that, you know, computer. Of course, we decide to make the teachers uh, go to the classes. No kids can go from a class to another class uh, to make sure, you know, we have less uh, people uh, moving from a place to another place for different purposes. Uh, next one, uh, the plexiglass, we had it in the uh, preschool, uh, KG and first grade. Uh, we don't have it in second grade and up. We have separate uh, desks. Uh, we have also uh, per teacher. Every teacher has it uh, because of different reasons. One of them, if we have a Quran teacher want to teach pronunciation, or a KG teacher who wants to teach, you know, phonics and kids has to see the mouth, then that is one of the solution uh, that they can speak, you know, uh, with a barrier, then they, the kid can speak and they can see, uh, uh, you know, their practice. Uh, this is uh, some pictures of what we have. Of course, we spoke about uh, if there is any symptoms uh, uh, confirmed from a staff or a teacher or even a student, we spoke about isolation uh, uh, room for uh, sick kids. We spoke about physical education. We spoke about prayer because we do, we have a gym. So we do our prayer, the Dhuhr prayer in the gym and we have it already set up for six feet between each uh, uh, child. And when uh, Friday comes, we do it in the mosque because the actual Friday prayer is in the gym. So we move to the mosque to avoid, you know, uh, having our kids with different, you know, uh, uh, groups of adults or uh, many people in that uh, spot. And we do our separate Juma which is perfect because our khutbah toward the kids, not the khutbahs that we usually hear in uh, some mosques, which is, you know, different level than the kids level. Uh, this is real quick, you know, uh, presentation. I hope everything was clear. And if you have any question, please uh, let me know. I'm inspired, mashallah. You had so much in this presentation, Brother Ziad. I mean, initially it was just like, I got the message, we are all in this together and our community is a resource. We really do need to reach out. And just as Brother William mentioned, when you challenge teachers, you challenge everybody, they will rise and they will all help and contribute. And it's beautiful to see. Plus your communications with your parents, mostly were focused on academics and safety communications. Those were the two highest priorities that you gave. And it was amazing to see all of the different safety features that you put into your school. So I'm sure people got really great ideas um, regarding those. To have a mock class put onto Facebook was ingenious because I'm sure a lot of the parents have a lot of apprehension about what's this experience really going to be like? And if I need to make a decision on if I'm going to have my child in school versus virtual learning, to be able to communicate what the class capacity is with a visual that everybody can see what the status is. If I was to be on the fence and not be sure, but I see that my options are closing, perhaps if I wanted to have my child in class, that's going to force me to make that decision and not waste any more time. And then finally, I took the note about having individual toy boxes for each child for the little kids it was wonderful to see. So thank you. Let me add uh, one more thing. So the mock class, we actually uh, uh, asked some teachers to act. Uh, you know, they are yeah. virtual and they are uh, turning the, you know, camera off and on. They are playing, they are eating, they are, you know, and we did the same thing in class. Oh, look at this, uh, it's not working. Look. So we did a whole scenario that parents were laughing and enjoying it and understanding what is the issue there. So, you have very brave teachers. I mean, not too many teachers would want to be out there doing their craft for yes. parents to see. It's difficult sometimes they don't even want the principal to walk in to see them, but the fact that they were allowing themselves to be seen by parents is wonderful. So thank you so kindly for that. All right. 
We have a new presenter to our group today, and I am so really happy to welcome Sister Faria. She's the principal of Aliman School in Raleigh, North Carolina, that goes pre to K, um, pre K to eight. She's serving the community um, in a way that has been just passionate for her. And this passion has led her to serve in several Islamic schools. She is a licensed middle school ELA teacher who has also served as a middle school team leader and accreditation team leader. She recently left the classroom to move on to her current administrative position. Her mission is to ensure students graduate from her school have a strong sense of Islamic identity as they transition into productive citizens in their respective communities. And prior to the start of our broadcast, we learned that she is a survivor of two weeks being open at her Islamic school. So take it away. Assalamualaikum. Thank you, Sister Susan. I appreciate it. Um, so as Sister Susan mentioned, I'm a fairly new administrator. So to piggy off back about what Brother William said, I'm really here to learn more. But I figured uh, whatever work we've done, and inshallah, if it's beneficial to anybody, please, you know, reach out. We've done a lot of work as everybody has been working so hard uh, in this current situation. This is year three for me. I was mentioning earlier to the group that, you know, year two was pandemic, year three is still pandemic. So alhamdulillah, um, you know, taking it as it goes. So if anybody's new in the position, uh, I, I completely sympathize with you. So we are uh, located in, um, in Raleigh, North Carolina. And like many of you, our summer months were um, very stressful. I have to be really honest with you, stressful. Um, we did, like uh, mentioned earlier from the other presenters, we had town hall meetings with our parents. We did approximately two to three town hall meetings to engage our families. Our first hall, town hall meeting was really um, letting them know what we were thinking about, what we're brainstorming, what were the options to hear their feedback and so forth. Our second town hall meeting was when we had finally finalized how our reopening would be so they would be aware. We wanted to be very transparent and clear with our communication and with our expectations for our families um, with the plan that we eventually laid out, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, we sent lots of surveys. We sent surveys to our families. We sent surveys to our parents. We sent surveys to staff, all these, you know, lots of surveys going out. We worked a lot with the medical team as well. So we have a COVID task force also. Um, our initial task force was with board members, administration, some parents, um, staff. That's how we started off. Our COVID task force has shifted, and as we keep going, I'll let you know what new role they play, inshallah. And I can't stress enough, and I, you know, I'm talking to veterans here, but the planning is key. Uh, as Sister Susan mentioned, I am now in week two, um, and I think I watched the last principal panel, and they all said they're sleeping better. Um, so am I. Um, so all the planning that you're putting in now, like, it's, it's really worth it. Um, you, it's a lot of work. I think if you're still, if you haven't opened yet, or if you're still planning for a different model, but the planning is key because now, you know, there's still so much on the ground, but the planning that we were, did in the summer, all that work that was put in really, um, it came to fruition in the past two weeks. So um, a big, so I'm very new in leadership, like I mentioned, but a big uh, um, caveat, a big for me was to engage our staff. So I also had town hall meetings um, with my staff. We had staff meetings when we were brainstorming. Um, we had surveys, but I did a little differently when we finalized our plan. I actually called each and every staff member at our school. Um, I'm a smaller school. We have about 40 to 50 staff members because what I noticed, um, our administrator noticed is everyone has a lot of unique situations when it comes to COVID. Some people are worried about, you know, high risk people at home. Some people are high risk themselves. Some people are worried about childcare. Some people are worried about finances. Everyone has so many different needs. And as a leader, I wanted to extend myself as much as possible to see, you know, what can we do to make this work for you? So when you come back, you can give us our best self, your best self as a staff member, because you really need your teachers, you know, 100% in the game because they're the ones who are gonna really drive this unique, form of learning for you. So it did take me some time to have those conversations, but I learned a lot about what, how my staff was feeling, what I, there were th some things I could just fix easily for them. For example, um, some of my staff needed childcare, so we went ahead and used our staff that wasn't working in their traditional roles to help with staff childcare. So that's an example that helped 
some staff members are like, yeah, we're good, you, you know. So my role in talking to my staff was to make sure as an employer, I am making as many um, accommodations for them, for them to be on their A game when they have to start with our students. So that was really important to me to engage our staff. Uh, hope that was me calling. Um, so our final reopening, what we ended up doing as of now, we have preschool open five days a week with reduced cap capacity. Our kindergarten through third grade are on campus in a hybrid model. They, we have an a, two cohorts, A and B, based on last names. Uh, we kept it based on last names because we told parents that they can reevaluate their choice every quarter. So they're locked in for the first quarter, but you can reevaluate um, based uh, every quarter. And we based um, the numbers on last names. So our last name breaking up is we actually counted like kids in their last names. <laughs> we did all that back work, but we wanted to make sure that if parents start feeling comfortable to send their kids on campus, we still had this space in our rooms with social distancing. We continued with a virtual only option as well for these uh, kindergarten through third graders. And we are only on campus Monday through Thursday and Friday, because Friday we are 100% virtual for everybody. Nobody comes on campus except administration and preschool. Um, we share the campus with our masjid, so they also have their own regulations and we wanted to be careful that we also respect uh, our masjid and their um, conditions as well. We started our fourth through eighth graders 100% virtually. And in the end, we really made this decision based on the feedback from our medical team. They had mentioned um, that in current research that kids 10 and older are the one, are, are, are as of now, transmitting COVID very similar to adults. So we felt it was just safer to keep them home. And as everybody on this panel knows, the older kids just do a lot better online. So we figured, okay, let's get the little ones at least on campus. Let's start with them. And it's been really helpful, to be honest, to just start slowly. Uh, that's been key because it helps you iron out any processes as you're going before you start bringing everybody on. Uh, so taking it slow has worked for us. We're already a small school. We're only till uh, middle school. We don't have a high school. So our daily safety procedures. Sorry for the graphic. So we do have um, social distancing. All our desks are social distanced, and I'll share some uh, live, some on-site pictures that I was able to take since we've been there two weeks. We have masks for all staff and students. And yes, little kids can wear masks. They've been doing a wonderful job. Um, I did in our town halls, um, we had some parents who were concerned, can my kid, you know, what happens if my kid can't wear a mask? And I was very firm with the expectation, then it's better for you to keep them home. But there are some parents, I did tell them, you know, you're the best teachers, our teachers are wonderful. And we are, you know, we will work to teach your child, but you have to put the effort in at home as well. And some parents did a wonderful job. They, there are kids who their mask doesn't move all day. They, they, little, I'm talking five, six year olds. So they're doing really great with the mask. So I know that's a concern a lot of people have had, but if you set the expect expectation and the practice with the families, it's been working very well for us. Um, we have an on arrival student screening and I'm actually going to get out of my screen just for a minute and share with you um, a different screen to show you our form. Um, we have a great, we have a board that's very helpful and who's very IT savvy. So hopefully you can see a form that says daily health assessment. Yes. Okay, I see that. This so is thank you. Um, and our daily health assessment is a, is a conditional form because we were going to begin just with Google Forms, but we realized if, we, if I start the form that we wanted this to be the language on the bottom to make it easier for us in the morning. So we get, so after you fill out this form and submit, it comes on an email and the parents just show us their phone, phone in the morning. That's all we do. But the conditional form lets you, so for example, if I said, in the past 48 hours, has anyone in the household been diagnosed with COVID and click yes, you see down here it changes to not approved. If I click no, it changes back to approved. So we wanted a conditional form to make it even easier for us. Uh, we weren't gonna sift through forms every morning. We just wanted to make sure the language was there. So this form has worked great for us. We just schedule it um, in advance in our email system and it goes out every day at 6 a.m. and the parents have really, and it goes out for staff as well. So if anybody, um, for example, there's one question here, are you living with anybody who's waiting on results? It says, yes, you're still approved with an asterisk. That means on site, we're gonna ask you questions because we understand now companies are asking people to get tested even if they don't have symptoms. So we wanted to make sure that we were 
you know, we, we would engage in conversation. So you could still come, but we're going to ask you a little bit more. So the form has worked really great for us. Um, if anybody needs help with a form like this, I'll direct you to our board member and I'll give them a heads up. <laughs> so going back to our presentation, we have um, the form. We also do screening, but we don't just do it in the morning. We also do it midday at lunchtime. We think it's really important to make sure that um, uh, we continue monitoring safety and health for everybody. So we do all staff um, and students again midday at lunchtime. So we have two screenings happening every day. Uh, this has been important. We've been open two weeks. We have caught people with fevers middle of the day. So then we go ahead and run through the protocol um, because you never know, you know, what time something's going to happen. And, and that midday checkup has been uh, helpful for us. We have a COVID-19 task force. And as I mentioned before, our planning task force has now evolved into a COVID-19 task force. So on site, we have a medical assistant. We don't have the budget for an actual registered nurse, unfortunately, at this time. So we hired a medical assistant. Their job is to do the screening in the morning, the midday screening, deal with any issues that might arise. If any parents have any questions, they contact her directly. Uh, she's on site all um, Monday through Friday. She is um, the eyes and ears on the ground, but her, if she herself feels that she cannot, uh, you know, if she needs more clarity, then we have a nurse who is part of the team who's a phone call away. And then Mashallah, one of the doctors in our area who deals in our state with COVID related issues and openings, he's also a parent. He's another resource she has. So if she has any uncertainty about a certain particular case, she goes ahead and gives them a call. And, and then of course, school administration. Um, if I to share, just reflect briefly on this task force. Uh, this has been great because in essence, I'm an educator, I'm not a, a medical professional. So to be able to have um, a group of people who have basically memorized protocols, know exactly what to do, dig really deep into it when we have issues come, arise, has taken a lot of burden off um, our shoulders in administration. Obviously, we still follow up, we make sure we ask questions, but the research and so forth is on our task force. Uh, for example, before school started, we did have two students who had signed up to be hybrid, but then they did, mashallah, our families have been great. They let us know that they were COVID positive. We supported them by dropping off resources. Our medical assistant calls them at least twice a week to follow up on how they're feeling, uh, giving them information and protocols. So this task force, if you're able to make this happen at your school, this has been very helpful on the administrative end to have this. So that's just something that was helpful for us. So this is a, a quick breakdown. I won't take too much time on this. We have group A that is on site Monday and Wednesday and group B that is on site Tuesday and Thursday. We based it on their last names. The, the breakdown might be a little bit um, weird, but mashallah, most of, most of the last names end with A. So that's why there's only a couple letters in the first group and the other uh, group is a little bit uh, more. And then Friday is asynchronous. Our teachers assign assignments and they are have office hours to work more one-on-one -on -one with our students. We also kept Fridays asynchronous because we know our teachers need a lot of time to plan because this is something brand new. So they, they spend most of their Friday, they spend their Friday either in office hours uh, reaching out for individual student concerns or working on planning for the following week. This is a sample schedule for people, um, those of you who are still in the scheduling midst of it because it's, it's a beast. Um, this is an example for a hybrid model, our hybrid K3. So all parents got different schedules. On the left side, it says what you're going to look like when you're on site and then what you are virtual. We're lucky most of our um, K3 classes have two teachers. So we in the beginning were going to just do the toggle teaching with the swivel and so forth, but we realized really quickly that that was kind of hard for younger students. So now what happens when you have this core subject time, for example, the on-site, one teacher works with the on-site students and then we have another teacher exclusively teaching to the students online. And then we have that throughout all the subjects because it is um, challenging to engage younger students online 
And then it's even more challenging when you add in the extra element of having to deal with your on-site students the same time as your virtual students. So, and I noticed a lot of my teachers were also very anxious about this model because it is something very new. So again, taking it slowly, we decided that, okay, one teacher can teach the on-site kids and the other one will teach the virtual kids. And with the cohorts, the teacher is always teaching the same students that she has. So that has worked for us. For our virtual students, the schedule, we, all, we start off as a school on morning assembly. Um, I go ahead and lead the assembly. We live stream it to our YouTube channel. Alhamdulillah, we got great participation. Our kids talk in the chat, they answer questions. They send me emails if we do like Trivia Tuesday. Trying to engage the ones at home as much as possible has been the goal. So that's been working well for us. Um, this is a fourth grade schedule. So they're home all the time. So this is uh, how their day runs out. If you notice, we have a full day of school. We did not decrease the school day. The only thing we did take away is the Fridays. So that's why we felt Monday through Thursday should be a full day. Uh, this is sample middle school. They have little less, oh, some less breaks than our other uh, younger grades. Um, middle school, of course, mashallah, they have been the most easiest to transition into the virtual world. Um, here's some pictures. We started our year off with resource pickup. We wanted to make it fun because school should still be fun. Balloons and goodie bags and you know all that fun stuff. Our mascot is a bee so we had somebody dress up. So we did our resource pickup outside. We did not have parents come out of the car. They checked in in the beginning with me and then they just uh, drove through, picked up. We had tables out for K through eighth grade and they picked up their books and left. Uh, we also provided Chromebooks. You see the cards out there. Our teachers did a great job organizing stuff just in bags with names put in the trunk and they left. So those are some pictures of our resource pickup day that we started off our week with. That was the first thing we did. Um, and this is what it looks like today. You can see we have students in mass socially distanced. On the left is our one of our first grade rooms. Uh, we do our rooms are a little bit small, so we do have li pretty limited capacity. So that's the first grade room. Our kindergarten room, very similar to Brother Ziad, we have individual toys. So on the bottom in the crates are toys just for those kids, and the teachers change out the bag the next day in the library. I don't know if you can see here. Uh, all the books are in Ziploc bags with the child's name on it and then the teacher changes those books every week. So to make sure that we keep the cleanliness. We also did increase cleanly, uh, cleaning on site. We hired a new cleaning person. We have a company that disinfects every two weeks, uh, deep disinfecting for the actual virus. All our cleaners are also EPA certified to combat the virus. So we have definitely increased the cleaning as well. And this is, a, this is snack time in your COVID world with little first graders. It is, when I see the picture, it's, it's nice because it's been all the planning we put into place, but in some ways it's also heartbreaking. But I, this picture, I know it, when you see it, you, it, you would, it's natural to feel a little sad because it's so not how kids are. But I have to say, as soon as they take a picture, they're still talking to each other, even though from, it's far away. They're still, they're still happy. They're kids. So that's kind of what snack and lunch looks like now. For us. Uh, we have lots of outside breaks, by the way, because we were, um, uh, I know based on the research, it was um, recommended to get the kids outside a lot of times. So we designated outside areas as well for our K through three grades if they want to do a lesson outside, whatever they need to do to use the outside space as much as possible. Uh, we're in Raleigh, North Carolina overall. Weather's pretty good. A little humid, but overall, alhamdulillah, doesn't get that cold. And, and that's really much it. Um, just, I guess, one reflection to share. If you haven't opened yet, uh, the first day was really hard, <laughs> to be really uh, honest with all of you. It was very challenging. Uh, the teachers left. We were all left like, oh my goodness, how are we going to continue? But we just finished two weeks now, and I just had a bunch of staff meetings, team leading me lead meetings yesterday, and everyone across the board has said, wow, this has gotten so much easier, alhamdulillah. So the first couple of days were rough, technology, assessments, drop-offs, like the whole, everything was, it was tough. But, you know, two weeks in now, everyone's getting used to our normal routine. So that's where we are now. Um, I guess if you have any questions, we can ask later, inshallah. Thank you, yeah. Samaykum. Well, you are an inspiration. You've made it through, and it's just fantastic to see. I, I noted, um, you said that there are so many different needs and worries. They are so varied. 
And so I guess the key is you really have to listen to your community because everybody has something different and we really can't anticipate what all of those needs and worries are unless we're really talking with people. Um, interesting that you mentioned to start slowly because I think a lot of the parents are always pushing like, hurry up, let's get on with the curriculum. But it's a very important point, especially now with this new paradigm that we take the time to really establish those relationships. I know oftentimes we'll look at, you know, you want to create that class community in the beginning part of your school year. It is more important now than ever. I'm curious um, also that when you have some students that are, are resistant to participating with the online uh, version, are there any certain tactics that you have found that maybe you suggest or you find your teachers are using, Sister Faria? So our teachers, we did ask them actually, just as you stated, to really start slow curriculum wise. I know everyone wants to jump in. We know there's a learning loss and gap, but you know, it's just like the classroom. The kids are not going to work with you until you get them comfortable as well. So the teachers spend a lot of time in the beginning with icebreakers, getting to know them. It is easier for our students that do come on site because they've formed relationships. It is a little bit more challenging for our virtual students. Alhamdulillah, the teachers have really, um, they really engage the kids well. Um, they make sure they, you know, they sit down with a roster and they actually make sure that they call on everybody virtually to make sure they're not missing anybody. Or, you know, the shy person in the back isn't being ignored. So they've used a lot of tactics to make sure that everyone is being engaged in this process. So it's, it's we're still learning as we go. Week two is nothing in a, a whole new, brand new environment. Alhamdulillah. We're getting there. <laughs> it sounds like you're doing really wonderfully. So alhamdulillah for that. I also appreciate it. I'm sorry. I don't mean to interrupt you, but I think, um, please make sure. Okay. Yeah. Someone had their camera on and I was, don't think they knew. That's all. Sorry. Oh, okay. Then, um, mid midday screening. I haven't heard of too many schools that are doing that, but now that you mentioned it, it makes all the sense in the world, particularly if somebody has a fever, usually it's lower in the morning, but by midday, something could kick in, or if the parents have given their kid Tylenol or something that might last them for about four hours, but then what do you do? Yeah, so, yeah. We were hoping our parents would not do that, but you always want to err on the side of caution. So yeah. that's been really, um, that's been critical. We've had, we, we've had kids uh, already, um, and we've had to monitor and triage and figure out what's going on, but alhamdulillah, that's where that COVID team has been coming in very helpful. Great. And I like the idea that since you didn't have the funds to have a full-time registered nurse on board, you were able to get a medical assistant to at least fill that important gap and take care of that midday screening. So brilliant. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Next up, we have Sister Aram Sheikh Shalani, another system board member who's been serving on a multitude of organizations from international schools to private schools for over 16 years. She's the head of school at Brighter Horizons Academy in Texas. Aram was selected in 2020 to represent private schools as a national distinguished principal by the National Association of Elementary School Principals. Her most significant achievements include developing curriculum aligned to American Common Core standards, leading accreditation processes with advanced ed, international baccalaureate IB curriculum, and establishing AP and IBDP programs. So take it away, Sister Aram. Assalamu alaikum everyone, how are you? Um, it's a pleasure listening to all of my colleagues that have gone uh, before me already. And I just wanna make sure that you can see my screen. Um, Sister Sue? Not yet. Kick it over. Okay. Um, share screen. There you go. All right. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. We are on. Um, yeah. Great. Alhamdulillah. I just wanted to, first of all, um, thank everyone that's spoken before me. Uh, Sue, thank you for moderating. Sufia, thank you for putting all this together. Um, it is... Um, unprecedented times that we're living in and this new norm certainly is um, something that takes uh, a lot for us to get used to. Uh, at BHA um, we struggled with a few things. Uh, we struggled with maintaining our mission and vision in this different context uh, of being online and on campus and hybrid and then we also uh, were looking as most Islamic schools if not all Islamic schools the financial impact that it's having uh, on our institutions in terms of enrollment, 
Um, what, what do you do in terms of furloughing and laying off or uh, if that's needed? Those are the harsh realities of, of the situation today. Trying to navigate all of that and yet still deliver on your mission vision um, becomes a, a large feat. Uh, we are coming back on campus on September 8th. However, we have started virtually already August um, August uh, 17th. Um, and one of the first things that my leadership team and I really focused on, as Faria mentioned as well, was staff are people too. And they have their own fears in this pandemic. Uh, as Faria mentioned, they have children that are school going or maybe don't even attend our school and attend a different institution. What do you do when they're online and your school is on campus? Um, what about uh, staff who maybe live with their in-laws or, um, or their mother and father or an elderly um, situation where they're high risk? So there's a number of things that are going on. And so those conversations are vital uh, for us to have. And we um, conducted a survey as Faria uh, explained earlier. Um, but after all was said and done, uh, we took proper measures to have staff supervision or stu supervision of their children on campus. We socially distanced them in various parts of the building, separated from elementary campus to high school, where pre-K through 12th grade institution. And um, we had pre-service all on campus, unless um, staff was traveling or needed to be quarantined for whatever reason, we then allowed for those situations um, to zoom in and be on campus. But we really needed to have interaction with our staff um, and, and make sure that our planning was spot on so that we could handle all of the challenges of the first day of school. Um, training was heavily focused around so their social emotional well-being. We had Define 360, um, Brother Wadud give a session on how to, you know, de-escalate your own emotions, how to um, overcome anxiety uh, that you may be facing as you're walking into this um, new norm. And then also we took a, a, a really strong look at uh, what fourth quarter looked like last year and take all of those learning lessons um, from what remote learning was like and now how should online learning be? There are two different beasts and with two very many you know, different components that, that take place in online learning. So we took it from that angle and helped uh, train our staff in terms of the differences between the two and what do we need to do this time around to make sure that our online learning was just as impactful as our um, on-campus learning. And as you know, uh, as leaders on this group, you're all shepherds of this flock, right? And so while, while the students and the parents are always our first priority, um, we need to take a step back and understand that our first flock at our hand is our, is our staff. And the more we take care of them, the better delivery of instruction happens with our students, inshallah. Um, as I mentioned, we opened on the 17th online for everybody. Um, we had a plan in place in terms of how to be virtual and on campus after the fourth quarter. We secured the technology that we needed. I'm going to zoom through this slide because many of the other presenters talked about very similar things. Um, we looked at swivel cameras. We looked at document cameras. We have a strong communications uh, platform as to what and how communication is going to look like from BHA in the event that there's COVID-19 case uh, with our students or with one of our staff members. Um, what does quarantining look like? Um, what, what does that communication in terms of if you've traveled? We have a survey for them to fill out and send back to us to let us know that. Um, definitely a lot of professional development around the methodology of teaching online. We had to change some grading requirements and procedures for homework. Um, last, one of the key differences that I remember from last year was that we didn't have attendance obligations and we did not have, um, we had a relaxed and very flexible homework um, and classwork policy. And what ended up happening is students either slept through their um, online classes and then they were scrounging to do their work. And then that seemed like it was a lot of work to be doing and or behind, you know, screen time was a huge issue for our community. And so we, 
not knowing any better, became very, very flexible in that, which caused a whole set of other issues on, on the other end. So this time around, we did it a little differently. We have attendance expectations for all of our students. Um, we are uh, definitely different classroom expectations, uh, classwork expectations that they must cons you know, complete a classwork before they leave um, that, on, that live session class. And then the cleaning goes without, uh, without explanation. Uh, all of the various CDC guidelines that needed to be followed in terms of masks in place, student transitions versus teacher transitions, lunches, outdoor lunches, etc. One of the um, key differences with our parent meet and greet was that we had um, done town hall meetings prior to the summer or in the summer, and we had all, um, all of the learnings from that, and we incorporated that going into the fall. Uh, and so we had all of our teachers of grade groups, so if it was specials, AQI, they all came together. We re pre-recorded uh, their presentations of what meet and greet looks like, what are their expectations with tardiness to class and attendance, um, what would happen in curbside pickup of your Chromebooks and textbooks. Um, and the administration also recorded a separate video on COVID readiness and communication in light of um, a, a case. So those uh, recorded sessions went out to all of our parents and they were able to, you know, um, watch them based on the grade group that their children were in. And then were able to contact operations and or administration around uh, what need what questions they might have that are the specific to their families we the student impact that we we saw is that number one students are no longer transitioning into the classrooms or transition classrooms teachers will be moving um, we have tried our very best to have a virtual only section uh, we have three sections per grade group so we tried to maintain one virtual only so that teachers focus is on those virtual students that they're not lost between students that are in front of them or students that are online. Um, we have live instruction um, to mimic the schedule of the day um, that would be on campus. Uh, same programs that we had of tutoring, breakout groups for small group instructions, um, that is still continuing through uh, Zoom. Uh, the teacher pops in and out of those breakout rooms and then inshallah when they're on campus, uh, we'll be doing something similar. We had a huge debate on swivel cameras versus document cameras. Uh, in June, we had purchased uh, almost $25,000 worth of uh, swivel cameras. We tested them out in our classrooms and realized maybe this isn't the best for our students. Um, the, student, the teacher was far away uh, and uh, the, maybe the online learners wouldn't be getting the, the best um, audio. So we invested in some document cameras and returned some of our swivel cameras, kept them for the gym classes or PE classes so that they could see the panoramic view of what the instructor is doing in PE. Uh, but then the document cameras are coming in exceptionally well. Uh, underneath the camera, you're able to show science experiments, you're able to show annotations in English, you're able to show textbooks, you're able to show work, worksheets um, and, and math problems that are uh, very crystal, crystal clear uh, with the uh, teacher's audio also coming in as clear. So that's worked well with it for us. Um, we have asked that all of our teachers come to campus, even if we're online, and that they will be uh, socially distanced from their peers in their classrooms to teach from campus. Um, we find that collaboration uh, across grade groups is better that way. Staff meetings are, are uh, better that way. Teacher observations uh, can be easily access accessible even when they're online. Um, and we do offer a full day of school, Monday through Friday. Uh, assemblies currently are online, or and when they do come back, they'll be over the PA system. And um, as Fergia mentioned, outdoor lunches as much as possible um, with Texas heat. <laughs> this might be a little difficult, but inshallah, we're going to try and, and make sure that they're outside um, for a good amount of time. Now, our parents were surveyed to see how many felt comfortable coming on campus and how many felt comfortable coming uh, online. And I think that's a typo, so forgive me on, uh, for that. But 60% of our parent population wants to come back to on-campus learning um, and 40% uh, 
um, want to stay online. And these numbers, since I created this presentation, has even moved up to online learning. So it now looks more like a 55, uh, 45 scenario. Uh, so there's definitely a divide in our community. Those parents who really are worried about, um, you know, the, the situation and, and COVID-19 um, and those who just really want, as William said, you know, I can't do this anymore, please take my children. Uh, so alhamdulillah, we're trying to manage both sets of expectations um, of online and on campus. And we've established codes of conduct for both. Um, not that they're very different, but when you're online, we need your Zoom na name to reflect your name. So we've had students, Panda Bear and Barbie and all of that, and we don't know who they are. So we want their Zoom name not to be an alias. Uh, we need their webcams to be on, especially in the waiting room before they're able to be let into the classroom. And we ask parents to have a quiet space for classroom and online. Part of the code of conduct is that they must be in uniform and they must go through the routines of brushing their teeth, making their hair, um, and, and being in that um, uniform sets the tone for them to be academically prepared and for the mindset of the school. Uh, we have a program currently at our schools called Khulukunadim, the prophetic character, um, that we are applying both online and on campus. And one of the things that we ask all teachers to do is make this the first thing that they teach when they, you know, get to know their students. We also ask that parents are not to interfere with the online learning process. You'll see a lot of um, the parents over the shoulder and saying that that's not the right answer or answer this or, um, you know, trying to, you know, as they're reciting Quran, maybe fixing the maharaj of the student, uh, you know, of their child in the background. So we, we do ask the parents that this is a safe environment. We ask that they not be involved. So we want to see what their students' academic learning is and not theirs <laughs> in a very respectful way. So we want to make sure that um, that happens. Now, as I mentioned, um, the financial impact has been significant. We had um, 820 approximately students at our school last year. Uh, this year, we're walking into 675. And so you can see that's almost a $600,000 loss for our school in terms of tuition. Um, and so we um, had a tuition increase this year that we uh, backtracked and said no tuition increase this year given the situation. Um, we created phases um, of what teacher staffing would look like and operation staffing would look like based on enrollment. <coughs> So we had one at 750, we had one at 700, one at 675. Um, we've had to have some creative fundraising ideas and created a, a committee around how we can raise some funds to maintain our staffing and our resources that we need. <coughs> Forgive me. <coughs> we have not backfilled any resignations and reorganized our staff uh, to fill those gaps in. We've also become creative with offering stipends to our staff for taking on extra responsibilities. Uh, it's, it would be much more economical for us than to filling uh, a, a teacher position if we distributed the load amongst some of our staff members that we have right now. Something noble that I put in there that um, speaks volumes for our Islamic school leaders, that our leadership team volunteered for salary cuts versus teacher cuts. Um, and that's the harsh reality that we're living in and some of the, um, you know, things that we need to consider to keep our institutions alive because we know the impact of Islamic schools. We know the impact that they're having as the future of our ummah and we can't afford for any of our schools to, to shut down or close down. So um, some drastic measures need to be taken, some sacrificing measures need to be taken so that we can ensure that legacy of our schools continue. Um, you know, the, the quotation that I always use is that we're building that airplane as we're flying it. Um, there is a short video that I'd like to share if we have time, but I'm going to refer to our moderators to see if we do have time for that. Um, but, but rest assured that we're all learning through this. Um, there's, there's all sorts of methods and ways that I'm sure you have employed in your schools um, and that even the, with the presenters today that I've 
take, taking some notes and we'll walk away from. So with that being said, um, Sue, uh, Sufia, do I have time? And if not, the link is there for you all. And I shared it in the Cisna Leaders Group as well. Sophia, I'll defer to you on the decision. I just have to say, I think that we're going to have the most clean schools this year than we've yeah. ever had. <laughs> Sophia? Um, uh, how long is the video? <laughs> it's four minutes. I, I think we could share it. And also, if, Adam, if you could also put the link in the, in the chat as well. Okay, sounds good. Will do. So I'll play the video and... Oh, yes. I've seen this. This is great. We all know we are living in unprecedented times, and I believe it's appropriate for me to begin with one of my favorite poems, The Road Not Taken by Robert Frost. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood, and sorry I could not travel both. And be one traveler, long I stood, and looked down one as far as I could. I got this stuck. <laughs> Have you heard of Kid President? Well, I kick superintendent. And I think we all need a pet. Aaron, we need your voice, your sound back on. <laughs> the past couple of months haven't been easy, huh? A global pandemic, politics. Social arrest, earthquakes, fire natives, Tiger King! No! That show is not what I thought it was about. Your glasses fogging up when you wear a mask? <laughs> Writing on toilet paper? The unmute and mute button! You're on mute! Spider merchant flies, desert locusts, and murder of foreigners. I mean, where do you even come from, man? You get the idea. Play 20 has been kicking our butt. I can say but, right? It's okay to feel overwhelmed right now. Or anxious. Or nervous about remote learning. Your bit mode is awesome, by the way. Maybe you're worried about students. I'm worried about myself and everybody else. But remember, we're all doing the best we can. And that's all that matters. Kids aren't looking for perfection. We're just looking for you to be present. I know that because I'm a kid. So let's be good humans. Let's sit here and take a look fish. Let's sprinkle kindness. By the way, I hate sprinkles. And let's give each other grace, not grief. We're all in this together. And we've got to support each other. It hurts. But you know this already, because that's what people do. You're resilient and resourceful. When times get tough, you know how to pull together. No cap. And there's still plenty of good stuff in the world, right? Like cinnamon till it's crunch. I see and Jeff from Chief, he's awesome. And Lizzo, my mom likes our music a lot, a lot. And funny TikTok videos. And Sharpie, you've got to love those. And we've got you. You are good. No scrap that. You are great. We need you here. No matter your job, you each have something special and amazing to offer. You can do virtually anything. Get it? Virtually? It's a joke. Seriously, you can do this. You are the champion Rita Pearson was talking. I believe in you. And I know you'll say RSD proud no matter the distance. It's kind of like Doc was trying to say. Two roads diverged in a wood. And right now, we got to take the one less travel. You know, and try the territory and you know. all. I know it might get a little scary. Actually, a lot scary. But you got this. Put on your favorite fuzzy sock. No one can see your feet on Google Meets. But definitely fill all your pants. And press forward with a positive attitude. It's going to make all the difference. Thank you. Okay. You know, I, I saw a video yesterday myself. It was a TED Talks where it was addressing leaders of innovative companies. There was research that was done over 10 years of several innovative companies around the world. And typically we think of a leader as needing to be, um, you know, the one with the vision that communicates the vision. But when you're in a novel situation, 
it's imperative that you get the voices of everybody and really the leader is just sort of sorting through and, and opening the opportunities for everyone else to demonstrate leadership essentially to be able to get the best of the ideas to argue ideas and to shake out what might be very messy but ultimately in the end works out to be the best solutions when all heads work together for the benefit of the mission of that entity so inshallah may allah bless all of you and I would just like to go, there's a question that came up in regard to teachers who are teaching concurrently, students in person and online at the same time. How has that experience been for those of you that can relate to that? Um, I'm gonna ask for each of our speakers to give their final words. And if you can address that question as part of that as well. So let's begin with Brother William, are you still there? Yes, I am. Final words, final thoughts, and do you have concurrent? My, my, my final thoughts are, one of the things that I am noticing is that um, when we plan these things, we spend a lot of time planning them, and we have a lot of conversations about them among our staff and our uh, admin teams. But I realize that everything is new, and everything takes a lot of explanation for parents for them to be able to understand what it is that we are doing. So I, I'm become guilty of that where we decided to have our orientations done in a certain way. So we had, you know, a parent online, and then we had an optional on campus, and then we had an online orientation. And the reality is, is that I understood it really well because I spend days and days talking about it. But no matter how clear the email is, people still don't get it. And I, we can't blame them for that because, number one, they're not living and breathing it as much as we are. And also because well, what is happening is that everyone has information overload, not just from what we're trying to explain to them about their kids' school, but just about their jobs and life in general. So I think the, the, the best thing I would say is to be very patient. And the other thing I would say is that try as much as you can to be humble and to be very empathetic with everyone that you deal with because everyone is just a big ball of stress and we are too. And I love the self-care thing, we need to do it. But we have to realize that our parents are really stressed out and our teachers are really gonna be stressed out. And if you haven't started yet, you're going to see um, a week into it, a day into it, you're just going to see faces on teachers who have been the most chipper, positive, optimistic people in the world look like a different person. And that's pretty common. And you might propose something that we do and you might just get this sort of reaction to things that you've never expected from people. And we can't react back to that. We have to listen to people. You have to show them that you, you are listening to them and think and talk them through it like everyone else has mentioned. Get their input on how we can solve these problems because we may have an idea of how we might want to bring kids on campus, but some teachers in their individual circumstances may react very emotionally to some of the ideas that we have. So we've got to listen through, through it and be patient and be as clear as we can about communication and communicate frequently in as many different ways as you can. Thank you. Brother Ziad? Yes, uh, we actually shared our expectation with the parents and the kids, and we asked them to stay for 10 to 15 minutes beginning of the class, so the teacher can explain the main concept, and then they can work on their, you know, whatever targeted, you know, work, and the teacher can help them during the class. And actually, we had also uh, like an office hours for each teacher. So office hours means if I have a problem with math and now it's Quran or Arabi, I cannot do it. I'll go with, you know, that office hour to the teacher to explain more, you know, uh, to me. But that's, that's what we did. And actually, you cannot make the kids stay like six hours just, you know, watching, you know, uh, classes. It's, it's difficult. But at least we agreed on 10 to 15 minutes main concept and then we left it to the kid and the parents to decide what the kid want to do. Got it. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, Sister Faria. Um, so I guess um, just a few parting notes and I can also answer the, I can answer the question first. We do have an, in, our, in our kindergarten class having the in-person online teaching at the same time for circle time. Uh, we have it in, in for that time and one other lesson in kindergarten. It's very short, it's not all day. 
Uh, my uh, the experience is practice makes perfect. It takes it takes a couple of tries to get the toggle teaching right. So if you can practice as much as you can, it's very you know you might practice as much, but when you have a room full of kids online, it, it's a whole different thing. So it's not going to be perfect the first time. Just expect that. But we have uh, we have done it in very short amounts for certain classes and certain subjects uh, based on the schedule. If we just couldn't separate virtual and on-site students for if, whatever limitations we had. So I would just say, yes, you know, we did it. We have, we are doing it for very short time periods, but the teachers are constantly testing out sounds and videos. Okay, do the kids at home hear it? Do the kids here hear it? So the first couple of days are just a lot of trial and error. Um, and some parting thoughts. Um, I guess I'll just leave the parting thoughts I told my staff at our first meeting. Um, I, as educators, you have to really dig deep as why you would continue to do this right now because it's a really tough situation. Um, and I think we brought it back. I brought it back to why I got into this whole thing for the first, uh, to begin with, uh, so many years ago, was really for kids and for our community. Um, no matter how crazy it was the first day, the kids behind masks, behind screens, they were so happy. And that just brought me so much joy. They were genuinely happy just to see teachers and their classmates because they're, school is normal like that's a normal thing kids have and that normalcy has been taken away so to give that back to them was just like a as a leader i was so joyful because they were so happy and in the end you know we as added community leaders in islamic schools are make are trying to make sure that these institutions that these giants before us have laid the found founding you know the groundwork for that we're continuing with them so i really oriented my staff on these two big goals like we're here to make give some normalcy to our kids and we're here to make sure that these organizations that people have worked years for um keep going because in reality with budgets and enrollment it, they're at risk so orienting our staff on these two goals has kind of really given us a common purpose like this is why we're doing this and and i really feel like that's driving our staff right now um and even those teachers i just want to echo what brother the brother said like I had a veteran teacher who's amazing, like that superstar teacher you have. She came out the first two days and she said, I have never felt that I'm not a good teacher in years. And she's like, that's what I feel like today. And you have to listen to them and you have to just constantly tell them, no, you're still really good. You're just new at this. Think back to your first years of teaching. What was day five on your first year of teaching? Yeah, that's where you are right now. That's where we all are. So, you know, keep engaging your staff. It's, it, it's a lot on them. So, and you really need them. So I would just stress those staff relationships as much as possible. Excellent advice. Thank you. Sister Yara? Um, the, the communications piece that um, William mentioned, we had invested in something called Video Scribe. Um, we noticed that in this day and age, everything is coming and uh, parents, everybody's inundated with emails and communication. Um, modes of communication and video scribe is actually puts word pictures to words so if you've ever seen a hand drawing certain pictures as you're speaking um to give that message to make it a two minute message but and to increase the frequency of it um, we notice that that has really been effective with our parents it can go through whatsapp it can go through email it could go through um you know messages uh, or call multiplier um we've noticed that um the communication has gotten much better if we communicate once every other day or every week in those small video bits. Um, so that's something that's kind of helped us. Um, the social emotional piece role with our teachers, definitely keeping them at bay in terms of um, understanding their uh, feelings and self-regulating. And uh, I also think that a huge piece all of this is um, while the situation taxes our professional um, our professional, uh, I guess, uh, stock. It also is taxing our spiritual stock, right? And so Islamically, your Iman levels feed your teachers, uh, feed their soul um, in terms of uh, Islamically giving them reminders that this is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make this pass, inshallah, you know, and that we continue to work as a family and as a team um, and understand that uh, we just need to endure this and be thankful for what we have and, uh, and grateful for what we have. So um, I think that's my, my big takeaway. Indeed. I think the mental health and spiritual health are very key 
And I'm looking forward to joining you guys with Brother Wadu this coming Wednesday for your next session from Define 360. I'm curious to know, um, Sister Layla, is she still with us? I think she had to leave. All right, Sister Sophia, I'm going to ask you, give us some updates on what's going on with Sisna before we go. Uh, I see Sister Layla. Go ahead, Layla. Oh, no, um, sorry. Layla's president. Um, Salam alaikum. I'm so, before I begin, I, I have, I wish I could show you my sticky notes from what I took from, um, I mean, I know you can see it's about 20 sticky notes long. Um, no matter how much you plan, you always learn something new, mashallah. And, um, I'm always in awe of our school leaders and all the things that you do. Mashallah, tabarakallah, may Allah reward you all. Um, and I'm, I'm grateful that we have Sisna. I really am. I'm, I'm so grateful that we have Cisna because I as a school leader don't know what I would have done um, the past six months um, I, I don't know that I'd still be here um, if we didn't have each other to turn to or the Cisna webinars and the, and the ISLA support that we've had throughout this um, and Cisna will continue to do that inshallah we're we're trying to ensure that we what we bring to you is timely like these these principal panels we know that our school leaders need to know what people have done what people are doing what's worked what hasn't worked and I think these are invaluable I know they have been for me um, and it's incredible how different um, the rollout models are for each school like the planning that goes in and then in the end each school has its own unique situation that they have to um, accommodate their families accommodate their teachers and accommodate their student needs so alhamdulillah um, so uh, we were going to move forward as as Cisna to provide you with professional development focused on the areas of leadership and governance and of course the core of what we stand for our mission in, in um, Islamic studies Quran and Arabic we we're going to focus on those areas and we will roll out um, more information about that as, as we move along um, Sister Sufia is there anything you'd like to add? And of course, one of the other major areas is where Sister Sufi has really taken um, a strong lead is advocating for Islamic schools when it comes to public funding and resources and really fighting uh, in, in this day and age for private schools to get a piece of the pie when it comes to all of these um, stimulus um, packages that are released by the government um, where they seem to kind of side sidestep on um, private students and um, sister Sufi along with other nonprofit um, private organizations are working really hard to ensure that our Islamic schools get their share of what whatever the government uh, at the state level or federal level is providing um, sister Sufi is there anything you'd like to add to that I, I don't think so. I think you covered everything. Thank you. And, and really, I just want to thank the, the principals who presented today. Um, just really invaluable, the resources that you've shared. And just hearing from you as opposed to just reading a, a WhatsApp chat or an email is just priceless. And we will, you know, we have the recording, we'll be posting it. So if any of, if you know of anyone who wasn't able to join, you can let them know and we will be sharing um, our, our resources as we continue to work for you. I just want to add one more, one more thing. Um, we we have done our best, and I think we've really um, stepped our game. I, I know our board, who are all um, school leaders um, in some capacity, or most of, have been balancing doing what they need to do for their schools, but also meet the needs of the schools at the national level. We've tried our best to support you. We really need your support. Um, we really, if you're not a CISNA member, please become a CISNA member. Um, it's very, very cost effective. I know we're, the budgets are tough. We, our um, membership fees are very low. And we also ask you to um, apply for accreditation as well. The stronger we are as an organization, the more we can provide for you as far as services. And um, we need our numbers um, to increase, inshallah. We know that we have a lot of um, schools joining us for these webinars we'd like to see that reflected in our membership so if you have not become a CISNA member school please do so and if you are not an accredited CISNA school we ask that you apply for that accreditation we spent a great deal of time before the pandemic alhamdulillah that that was in the works um, revising our accreditation standards to really ensure that our schools have stellar um, Islamic components in their schools and really um, ensuring that our mission is fulfilled.
Again, Jazakumullah khair to the presenters today. That was amazing. Um, MashaAllah. I'm, I'm in awe. I'm always in awe of our school leaders. I think we should be running the schools at the national level and then we'd be in a better place. I mean, inshallah, one enough. day. I think also many people have lost uh, in their enrollment to the public schools that are offering, you know, free. But the thing that makes our schools unique is that we capture the subjects that are most sacred. And there's no price that you can really put on that. So the fact that if we have standards and we stick to them, we level up our, our schools. And who doesn't want to have their child in an accredited school? So inshallah, we'll be able to maintain all things as we go forward. Sister Layla, will you give us the closing dua, please? Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Nashadu la ilaha illa ant. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. والعز إن الإنسان لا في خص إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر السلام عليكم everyone جزاكم الله خير for attending وعليكم السلام and thank you السلام عليكم all take care السلام عليكم everyone